Hello and welcome to Attacking Third, the CBS Sports Soccer Podcast. I'm Sandra Oreda, lead NWSL writer for CBS Sports. Joined today, as always, by my colleague and co-host, Lisa Roman, broadcaster and analyst for CBS Sports. On today's show, we have some news and notes to go over, an NWSL midweek game to preview for you all. But we've also got some updates about the Women's Cup and Women's ICC. So we've got some things to get through today. So thanks for joining us live. Uh, and if you are joining us, we just want to give you a quick reminder before we get into everything that you can watch all our episodes and exclusive interviews on YouTube. Subscribe to our page to get notified whenever we go live at youtube.com slash attacking third. And again, we've been thanking you all month. We're going to continue to do that. So thank you all for voting for us in the People's Choice Podcast Awards. Thanks to you, we have advanced into the final round. And if you voted for us before, please check your email because about a third of you are going to be getting an additional email asking you to vote in the final round. So please, please check your spam folders for an email with the subject titled Podcast Awards Final Slate Voting. And you can vote for Attacking Thor to win the best female-hosted podcast. Thank you all so, so much. I thought this was going to be a chill day, Lisa, but you know what? The soccer never sleeps, and we got to talk about all the things. There are so many things when we were um, writing our rundown and and chatting about all the different things we have to talk (laughs) about. It was like, okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. (laughs) Midweek NWSL, WICC, the Women's Cup. There's news. There are trades that are happening. Um, Mm. Everything is happening very fast. A lot's going on. And thank goodness we're here to chat about it. We've got each other. We've got you if you're joining us live in the chat. Um, Yes, you can drop us questions in the chat. We will try to answer them as best as we can as we go through this episode but there's definitely a lot to talk about so thanks everyone for joining us and Sandra it's always great to be with you how are you today I'm wonderful I'm here with you getting uh, to talk about all things uh, soccer once more that's always a good day for me quite frankly um yeah I would love to you know be able to field some questions but again it's like we have these episodes where we're like hey like maybe this will be the week where we get to go back and do our mailbag and it like it it keeps it keeps getting away from us a little bit because there's always so much um, really incredible stuff in in the works uh, across the globe and here in the U.S. in terms of this week in particular. So this is going to be another one of those episodes. We're going to do our best to get through all of this action. But let's start with the news portion of things here before we get into actual games and what is on the slate midweek here. Some NWSL news. Uh, Laura Harvey did, in fact, make a trade. Allie Watt traded from O.L. Reign to Orlando Pride for $125,000 in allocation money. So that was some recent news that dropped that we wanted to bring here on the episode. Maybe talk a little bit about it. What what does this mean, a move like this, uh, you know, if it does have any implications? What could it mean for... OL Rain, what could it mean for Orlando Pride? Uh, just initial reactions to this, like when you saw saw the press release drop, Lisa. I was pretty surprised, honestly, that Laura Harvey was willing to let go of a player like Allie Watt. But um, clearly the conversations there between Orlando and OL Rain have been happening. $125,000 in allocation money is a lot of money. We know how uh, Laura Harvey likes to bring in some superstar players. Who knows what she's got in the works um, in, in terms of what this trade means. But Allie Watt, the 25-year-old attacker for OL Rain, she played in 14 matches this season, three starts. She's Definitely a player that saw time under Laura Harvey and, yeah. and saw minutes, made an impact in games. Sometimes we see these trades happen, and it's a it's a player that isn't making as much of an impact. And even you think about the Ebony Salmon trade from Racing Louisville to Houston, she wasn't getting a lot of minutes at Racing Louisville, so now this is an opportunity for her to get more minutes at Houston. Um, and, and likewise here with Watt, it's definitely got time with O.L. Reign and under Laura Harvey contributed on the pitch. But in in terms of attackers, the starts that Allie Watt was probably going to see towards the end of this regular season, not as many. I mean, she only had three up until this point with O.L. Reign. And when you look at the depth of the roster that Laura Harvey has, um, the spots for Allie Watt, like it makes a little bit more sense to get rid of an attacker for Laura Harvey. And on the other side, Orlando Pride bringing in and a player 25 years old like Watt is huge for Orlando's roster. They've 
they're a team that's been grinding out wins, getting ties, pulling some points here and there throughout this regular season. And to throw a player like Watt into the mix that can play alongside uh, Darian Jenkins and um, everything else that they have going on in, in that front line Clough, I think that Watt can bring in a lot of energy and a spark. Honestly, this is a great trade for Orlando and, and maybe it won't hurt OL rain as much. I, I agree with you in a lot of parts of that. I think probably the first one of that, like what you said with your initial reaction was maybe a little bit surprised because even though Ellie Watt was a player that maybe wasn't getting tasked with the start mm -hmm. in this OL Reign squad, she was getting fairly consistent appearances within games, right? So I had wondered if what we're going to see from this OL Reign team down the stretch of this sort of second half slash final third of the season was perhaps going to see a move like this because they made a move for Tobin Heath. They made a move for Jordan Heidema just as that massive summer of soccer was kind of underway and kicking off. Mm -hmm. And I did have something lingering in my mind. Like, man, you're, you're just picking up like these very like, uh, like attacking offensive minded types of players what is that going to mean or how is that going to, you know, impact starting 11s going forward? Because it's so, in some, in some ways you're like, you want to try to get as many of these talented players on the pitch as possible. So when you are bringing in somebody like perhaps, for example, like a Tobin Heath, that the, it, everyone was an understanding that she was going to be working her way into form yeah. And then you also have somebody like an Ellie Watt who is coming in and off of the pitch, you know, in certain moments kind of as a game changer for this team. Where does that leave, you know, these these two players? So I think with the return of Tobin Heath and quite frankly, her immediate impact uh, for this team coming off of the bench in recent games, I think maybe it kind of forced some conversations um, in motion. And I think and for a player like Ali Watt, who had been getting con like fairly consistent appearances, we'll just say maybe not made appearances with this rain team. Maybe she's at a point where she's needing to ex extend those minutes. She's a much younger player mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. league. And maybe Orlando Pride is a place, you know, where, where she can go and get those minutes. Yeah, I think that's a, a benefit that Ali Watt has now going to a team like Orlando. I mean, she's been with OL Reign um, since 2021 season. Uh, she's been in the NWSL since 2020. And yeah, she is young at just 25 years old. So, uh, but there comes a balance when playing alongside players like Megan Rapino, Rose Lavelle, Jess Fishlock, Tobin Heath is a benefit and you can learn so much from them. But then, uh, a player like Watt also needs minutes on the pitch to use all that she's learned playing alongside those incredible internationals and those players to actually put it in into work and, and try it out on the pitch. So honestly, I'm really happy about this trade in terms of, of Watt and on a personal level. We'll see how she does with Orlando and under Seb Hines, who's, who's been on a bit of a tear yep. right now in the NWSL. I think it's a huge benefit. I imagine that she'll get – pretty consistent minutes, try to get into a flow of the players that they have there with Pruitt and Jenkins and, and Clough and Timrak, um, see if she can fit into the system that Orlando has. Mm -hmm. And it could really benefit a player like Watt moving forward in her career. Yeah. And you, I think I just, you know, I think at this point, like you're, you're looking at a player like Watt who is still considered part of like the young generation of players that currently exists in NWSL. But at this point, this is going to officially be like her third team. So going, being drafted, you know, from in, into Carolina's system going to all rain and now will be with the pride. I'm, ho I'm hopeful that this will be a place where she can, you know, find her way into the starting 11 and stay there quite frankly, because I think she's a very talented player. She's someone who I think does have a high ceiling. We just, you know, yet to see that because she had to deal with an injury coming into her, into her rookie season. So what we've seen, I think with her time with OL we're starting to see what Ali Watt could bring onto the pitch and provide for a team. And I think if you're or Orlando, I think maybe there are folks who maybe look at that number, they get fixated on that, that allocation number um, because, you know, the type of player matching the, 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 the actual number and people are kind of like, well, is that too much? Like, did you give too much? Like, you know, but if this is a player 
that they perhaps are targeting and saying, we want to keep here for a long time. We want to invest in, we intend to build with perhaps around somebody like the Aliwa, then maybe you do give up that sum of money and you have to look at where they are in the table. I mean, Lisa, you know, you've, you've brought it up like, Hey, like, are they going to play spoiler or are they actually going to push and make a run? And can a player like Watt contribute to this already, you know, six game undefeated streak, from the pride and we've seen Darian Jenkins come off the bench recently. So perhaps, you know, again, long, long season, the, the season, the regular season is a grind. So who knows if, if players are perhaps picking up some small knocks a- along the way that maybe aren't, you know, going to keep them all of the game, but perhaps on limited minutes, who knows if that's what's going on with um, a player like Jenkins. And if, if that is the case, you have somebody like Watt who can help perhaps supplement those minutes. So I think, Ultimately, it could potentially, this one could potentially be a bit of a win-win here. Yeah, I definitely think it is a win-win. And we'll see kind of what, oh, well, rain happens. I think there's like a follow-up that's coming with this, but we'll see. Yeah, we will. Uh, some other news and notes uh, for uh, another team. Uh, this is kind of fun, actually. This isn't necessarily like groundbreaking transfer <laughs> window type of news, but San Diego Wave uh, recently made an announcement that they're going to host their first ever Hispanic Heritage Night on August 20th at Torero Stadium. They announced that there's going to be a uh, broadcast partnership. So, channel uh, the local Channel 12 Televisa partner is going to highlight San Diego's Hispanic culture in a fun filled night. They are giving it a th- theme uh it's under the theme of uh una ola one wave so uh it's they're talking about the festivities that are going to kick off with a ton of giveaways and limited edition merchandise um and they're actually going to have mariachi music from mariachi del mar so that's really fun i love mariachi music nothing gets a party started off like the mariachi <laughs> um and they were also talking about it within this release that um prior to the match they're also going to be making a donation so they're issuing a donation check to the chicano federation on field and the chicano federation has been at the forefront of equity and access in its communities for over 50 years, providing social services, childcare, workforce development, affordable housing, and more. And uh, the Wave FC will also honor influential Hispanic leaders from the San Diego community. So very excited for that, quite frankly. Um, There hasn't been a ton of Hispanic heritage theme nights throughout NWSL. That makes me sad for a number of reasons. And uh, quite frankly, there have been the, the the attempts or one or two attempts I think that have been put into place um, haven't really been elevated to to this you know caliber for for some for some franchises uh, franchises out there it, it is about like trying to find like a local Spanish broadcast partner and being able to shoot the game and that's great um, but I love that San Diego didn't stop there they didn't just say let's put the game on in Spanish <laughs> like and call it a day that's enough and. We don't need to tap into the community at all. Um, but San Diego is the opposite of that. And I like that um, they've got all this fun stuff wrapped up uh, in this in this particular event for them. So I hope hopefully uh, it'll go off without a hitch and they get a lot of people. They've been, you know, often had some sellouts, at, even at Toreo. So this is maybe a fun little event to sort of have before they make their way off to, to Snapdragon. And I'm excited to see it play out. Uh, yeah, but- I love this for San Diego. And the fact that, I mean, you mentioned the sellouts at Toreo. Yeah, they, they sell out Toreo frequently. They pack that stadium. And I think that this is a great way to do it. As you said, a little party beforehand, yeah. celebration, um, the donations that they're collecting as well. It's, it's honestly fantastic um i like this fun news that we do yeah, it's always <laughs> fun to, i love when that kind of stuff drops into the inbox you're like oh this is very very cool let's talk about it on a3 um also we're gonna get into the, <laughs> we're gonna get into this uh but gotham fc will also be uh playing in philly so they're gonna be playing at subaru park at least i know you're excited about that uh, of course I am. Yes. As a Philadelphia native, I'm not super close to Red Bull Arena in Harrison. I'm not super close to Segra in Leesburg, Virginia, or even where DC United plays at Audi Field. They're a couple hour drive for me. So I don't always get to go to home NWSL matches, especially to cover them or rather, especially to go for fun and just experience it. Uh, so this is fantastic. They did it last year when Carly Lloyd went on her um, farewell tour with Gotham after she announced her retirement, which was actually like just about a year ago at this time in the middle of August. Um, so because of that, 
they came to Subaru Park. They had an incredible turnout of fans and things, and I know they wanted to do that again. I, I know that the Gotham leadership and management said that um, coming to Subaru Park in Philadelphia, where the Philadelphia Union of the MLS plays, was a huge thing for them last year. I'm so glad they're doing it again, so they'll be there this weekend. We'll talk more about it um, when when they continue on their little bit of a tear, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm very excited about that. I, I love all these little like news and notes things we're dropping in here. <laughs> we are, yeah. I like that you mentioned that we are going to preview a Gotham game uh, on this episode, but it's actually not going to be the Subaru Park one. But we, we were talking a little bit about San Diego's uh, fun fun event, and we wanted to talk about the venue change for for Gotham a little bit is as well. So uh, fun stuff coming out of NWSL. Let's shift a little bit globally before we finally start talking about some game previews. Folks had a lot of feelings about this one, Lisa. So we're just going to present it as how it was presented to us. But the <laughs> nominees for the 2022 Women's Ballon d'Or dropped. And uh, let's just run down the complete list here for everybody. Uh, uh, Selma Bach of France and uh, out of Lyon. Love what we've seen out of that player. Uh, was really hyped to sort of see her name on this list. And that's all I'm going to say about it. Uh, Atiana Botmati, Spain, FC Barcelona, Millie Bright, England representing Chelsea, Lucy Bronze, England, Manchester City, and FC Barcelona. Uh, Kieratu Diani, France and PSG, Cristiani Endler, Chile, Lyon, Ada Hedeberg, Marie Antoinette Cototo, Sam Kerr representing Australia and Chelsea, Katerina Macario, Representing USWNT and Lyon, Beth Mead, England and Arsenal, Vivian and Miedema, Holland and Arsenal, Alex Morgan, another USWNT player. Uh, this this category, she's qualified for both her time with the Pride and San Diego Wave. Lena Oberdorf, Germany and Wolfsburg, Asia Al Shashala, Nigeria, FC Barcelona, Alexandra Pop, Wolfsburg, Germany, Alexia Padea, Spain, FC Barcelona, Wendy Renard. France and Lyon, Trinity Rodman, USA and Washington Spirit, and Frida Lina Rolfo, Sweden, and FC Barcelona. Lisa, thoughts? Do you have a take? Is it a hot one or a cold one? These types of lists sort of bring out opinions uh, from everybody. I guess that's one of the <laughs> purposes that they serve. But uh, reigning winner, uh, I remember this time uh, last year when the when the news dropped and Folks were sort of targeting, like, who who could be the winner of this one? And mm -hmm. um, we know that uh, Alexia Pateas has, uh, you know, had an incredible run and, and earned the honors in that one. Is there anyone sticking out on this list for you? I mean, of these 20 names, they're incredible talent. And we are, um, maybe for some fans that are listening to this or people tuning in live that didn't know a lot of these names say even six months ago but you watched the euros and now you recognize a lot of them um this is a great way to kind of find some great players on great teams and keep an eye out for them i was a little shocked that Trinity rodman made this list three u.s internationals in katarina macario uh, alex morgan and then trinity rodman so morgan and rodman both in the nwsl I was a little shocked that Rodman was named to this one. She was rookie of the year in the NWSL with Washington spirit. She yeah. won the championship. So when you look at on paper, the accolades that Rodman has done, um, it makes a little bit more sense. However, can stacked up against some of these other players. I just, I just don't think Rodman's going to win it, <laughs> but yeah. to be nominated is such a huge honor. Uh, it is such a huge honor. It gives a lot of recognition to these names, gives them a lot of notoriety. It, it definitely um, makes them a little bit more popular in their current teams and, and the seasons that they're either currently in or about to start with. But um, that was probably the biggest shock to me, but um, yeah. excited to see, see that young name on there 20 year old Rodman there's two 20 year olds Rodman is uh, the second youngest on this 20 player list but October 17th in Paris is when the winner will be named and crowned uh, for you Sandra any names really like jump out at you as like yes you're gonna win this or why are you on this list what's happening here well I was I was really hyped to see Katarina Macario on there I was like yes this is awesome I mean, love to well see that deserved. well deserved love to see that for for one of the young players um who who also represent u.s women's national team um but i was i was like oh as thrilled as i was to see somebody like trinity rodman on this list there was a part of me where i was just kind of like oh i don't know if like this is 
that's maybe like a real long shot here, right? In terms of um, some of the other names that are across this 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 final list. Um, but I also am like, well, if you're looking at a certain window of work in order to be, you know, considered, um, you know, a, a nominated for this type of list, like when you look at Alex Morgan, for example, and they're including an extensive body work with the Pride. <laughs> And San Diego, because I think it goes from like August to, to June or so the window of the, the body and window of work in which they look at. So I think if you look at somebody like Rodman, who had an incredible rookie season, um, went all the way to the championship final, became, uh, you know, an NWSL championship in her rookie year, earned rookie of the year honors, had set um, <laughs> had set some records in place right during a rookie season. Um and finally started to get some looks at the senior women's national team. But I do wonder, um, looking across maybe some other performances around that, like I was a little, if we're looking at uh, profiles of work, I was a little surprised to maybe see Rodman over a Sophia Smith um, yeah. in, in this type of, of list. If you're looking at, if the concept was like, who's the next like young, exciting like kind of US WNT slash NWSL player, you know, really kind of making a name for themselves. And it it's absolutely, I think, without a hitch, like Sophia Smith, she's having oh, like yeah. an MVP caliber type of year. Um, so I was a little bit surprised in that, you know, in terms of like kind of maybe looking at differences in performances. But I think this is a very strong list, no matter what. I think any of these players in their own uh, respective position have kind of dominated some things here. Um, but I think when we're looking at maybe front runners, I'll say um, for me, uh, Box is uh, up there. I loved watching them during the Champions League. Um, I would love to see uh, her steal some votes, uh, but, you know, I don't know. You know, there's politics, I'm sure, that are involved in, in votes like this. But front runners for me would be would be her. Sam Kerr would be up there um, as well. I would include Katarina Macario in that. I thought she was very impressive off of off of the year uh, that that she had. And I, I you absolutely have to have um, England representing um, in this in this sort of mix. So in terms of like top four or top five, I think you also maybe put in somebody you know, like uh, uh, Beth Mead, quite frankly, or somebody like, uh, you know, a Millie Bright, perhaps. Um, but yeah, see, we're not the ones who vote for this stuff. We're, we just read them off and sort of talk about the players and, and who are on there. <laughs> we're so. just here to give our opinions. We don't get to vote we're, in this. Yeah. But, <laughs> but it's interesting you mentioned the Trinity Rodman versus Sophia Smith. And yeah, I agree. I would have uh, been less shocked to see Sophia Smith's name on there versus a player like Trinity Rodman. But the it, the interesting thing about the Ballon d'Or is it goes from August to July. That's yeah. why a player like yeah. Thank you. Alex Morgan is being recognized for her time at Orlando Pride and also mm. San Diego Wave. And that's why Trinity Rodman is being recognized for the 2021, the end of the 2021 season in the NWSL where she – one rookie of the year. She won the NWSL championship. She got call-ups to the national team. And, and if you look back to August to the October when the NWSL season ended, even August to the end of the year in December with what Rodman was doing with her club and with country getting call-ups for Black Wendonofsky and the U.S. Women's International team um, through July of this year, because that's how the calendar goes. It makes a little bit more sense, but that's also why a player perhaps like uh, Katerina Macario was most definitely listed on this and, and given a nomination for her time with Leon last year and, and last season, what she was able to do. Uh, truly fantastic with Leon and then suffering a bit of an injury. So I know that some questions have been thrown out there. I thought this player was injured. I thought this happened. Yes, this season goes from August to July. It's not a calendar year. So it gets yeah. a little bit of overlap for everything. So I wanted to clarify that for everyone. We'll see how it shakes out. We'll keep an eye on it for sure. And I'm obviously when the winner is, is announced, we'll, you know, come through here and, and celebrate that as well. But let's shift our focus back to NWSL for a second ahead of our break here, Lisa. There is a midweek match that is taking place. We've got Houston Dash versus New Jersey, New York, Gotham FC. This one kicking off at 8.30 p.m. Eastern time in Houston. You can catch all the action on CBS Sports Network. Lisa, quick turnaround. 
for for these two teams. Uh, who are you looking at? Do you have a winner? Do you have a loser? Do you have a draw? Tell me what you see out of this one. Incredibly, incredibly quick turnaround. Houston played on Friday. That was the 0-0 draw against Racing Louisville while Racing went down a player in the 44th minute, 43rd minute, um, and Houston really dominated the first half. Meanwhile, Gotham, even quicker turnaround. They played Sunday to a 4-1 loss to OL Reign. That was at Lumen Field and now got them traveling to Houston. So I imagine they went straight from <laughs> Seattle to Houston, um, which is, that's a lot. It's a lot of travel. Those are heavy legs after a 90 minute four, one loss to OL Reign. And now they've got to go to the heat and humidity in Houston and play against a dash team. That's frankly on a bit of a run right now. Number two in the standings, they've won three of their last five. They're four games unbeaten at this point. Uh, Houston, I have Houston winning this match, but there are so many different factors and reasonings that come into it. I think Houston is a team right now that we're seeing is is growing from game to game and learning so much about what they've been able to do. And and when you look at a coach like Juan Carlos Amorosos is, is a coach that um, – teaches his players kind of what happens. And when you look just at the last game that Houston played against Racing Louisville, they dominated the first 45 minutes. Probably could have had two goals. They they did so many things well. When you look at a player like Ebony Salmon and how she's been on such a tear, scoring six goals already for Houston since arriving in the beginning of July to this club, they understand what needs to happen. The fact that they didn't close out the game against Racing Louisville uh, probably frustrates Houston at this point. And now going into a game against Gotham, uh, Houston is a team that's going to want to score goals, want to get points, want to rack up their goal differential. Because right now their goal differential is nine. And if I'm Houston, I'm saying let's get three. Let's get four. We've done it before. We've done it consistently before. This Houston side coming off of a 4-2 win over Gotham just at the end of July. So now they're at home. They've got the upper hand. They're coming off of a tie that they want to do. Um, I give this one to Houston. But, Sandra, when you look at Gotham, <sighs> we've got the new coach coming in there, Hugh Menzies. And mm -hmm. Do you expect any changes from the Gotham side? I don't I don't anticipate maybe there will be change. I would like to see Taylor Smith get, you know, get a start. Get a goal. Um, and, get a goal. and see, and see a, a 90-minute game from her with Gotham and you know, they did score a goal. It was, it was another loss for the team, their fourth consecutive, but they scored a goal. They scored a goal and it came from Taylor, Taylor Smith. Um, but there's, there's apprehensions I have in giving this to, to Houston because my gut is like, yeah, go with Houston. They've got great pieces. They've been putting together really good performances and Gotham is a team down on their luck. And when you are a team that is riding the momentum and sitting very happily in the upper half of the table, there's no disrespect in looking at your opposition saying, like, we need to go out there and get these three points. But it's the midweek matchup I know. of it all for me, Lisa. These midweek games are such a clog sometimes. I don't know what we're going to see really from these two teams. Are we going to see um, a little bit of a physical matchup perhaps? You know, is Gotham going to try to supplement, you know, uh, you know, being able to sort of break up or sustain that attack by maybe getting a little bit more physical, trying to play it a little bit more closely? I don't know. We'll see. There's a mixed bag here because – I think we've yet to see sort of what humans impact could actually be on this Gotham side. That was the one game, the first game that he got introduced in. So maybe the second game will look and feel different, but I don't know if the, if, if, if the results are going to come that quickly, especially on a quick turnaround in a midweek match. So despite me feeling like the midweek match is always kind of a toss up, those can sometimes end in a lot of draws. I'm still going to be going with Houston in this one. Quite frankly, you if they go run around there, I wasn't sure. Quite frankly, if they go out here and they don't pick up the dub against Gotham, I think they're going to be disappointed in themselves. So I'm hopeful that Houston will go out here and pick up all three points against Gotham, perhaps make that one and two seating even more interesting in the upper half of the table because they've got a, a long one, a long week in them, right? So they've got this Wednesday game and then there's games to look at ahead into the weekend. 
So maybe they want to secure these three points, you know, and get the job done on a Wednesday versus later on in a Saturday, because then that'll be another quick turnaround when they've got games this weekend as well. So we're both going Houston and this one. We'll have to come on back and see if we're correct. Stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. Lisa and I are going to talk about the Women's Cup and the Women's ICC right after a quick break. We found your daughter. She's alive. Mister? It's mommy. Four years is a long time. Welcome home. I think something's going on with Esther. She seemed different. Since she got back, there's constant lying. There's outbursts of anger. Orphan First Kill, rated R, streaming August 19th on Paramount+. Plus. All right, the Women's Cup is on Paramount+. Plus. We want you to watch. So we are giving away a hundred dollar Paramount plus gift card here at attacking third to enter. You have to like this video, subscribe to attacking third YouTube page and drop your social media handle in the chat or in the comments. And we'll pick a winner. You could watch NWSL, the women's cup and more on Paramount plus. So like subscribe and comment for a chance to win the women's cup. In case you missed it, it kicked off already. We chatted a little bit about it. Got kicked off on Sunday. We've already got semifinalists in play, and that is what is going to be happening this midweek match. You can watch all the matches on Paramount+. Plus. You can watch all highlights for the Women's Cup on Attacking Third YouTube. But we're going to have two semifinals, and now we have the introduction of the NWSL teams in the Women's Cup. So the quarterfinal round took place between uh, AC Milan and Tokyo Verde and Club America and Tottenham. AC Milan and Club America won their quarterfinal round, so now the semifinals are set. O.L. Reign will be kicking things off with the first semifinal versus Club America at 5 p.m. Eastern. Why don't we have some fun and make picks in these two, Lisa? Do you have do you have a winner in this one, O.L. Reign versus Club America? Um, so I'm super impressed with Club America and what they were able to do in their opening match of this women's cup going up uh, against a team um, like Tottenham that perhaps would have, would have, could have, should have won this one against Club America. I think uh, having Club America, the team from Mexico come in and really impose their game on a Tottenham team that is in the very beginning stages of their preseason, but uh, the women's super league is coming up so quickly. Um, I think the battle between club America and OL rain is going to be so good to watch just be based on the different styles of play and how OL rain really loves to move the ball, switch it from side to side, be creative in the attack. And, and the club America players like to be technical on the ball, keep it close to them. Um, it's almost like similar to what you could see from the Tokyo side, but between Club America and OL Reign, I think this will be a really big test for Laura Harvey's side. And um, I'm not sure if we'll see some player rotation as this is a pretty quick turnaround uh, for OL Reign going from a weekend game into this Wednesday midweek match that doesn't even count towards NWSL, but it is the Women's Cup. So between these two sides, I, I think I see O.L. Reign getting the win just because Club America did submit a goal to Tottenham at the end of this one. No. Um, but it, I think it was almost a lucky like start, not lucky start by any means. It was a great game, but I think O.L. Reign can understand how to attack a team a little bit better than Tokyo did. And, and it'll be a battle, but I think O.L. Reign is going to come out victorious in this one. Who do you have between Club America and O.L. Reign? Listen, I want to see the upset happen. I want to see Club America go on a run and lift the Women's Cup. I would love to see that for a Liga MX Feminine team. But something that we've noted in some of our previewing and some of the interviews that we've had with players participating in the Women's Cup is there's a mix of different kind of teams here, right? Besides teams from different leagues in different countries, which are going to be representing different types of style of play, right? That's number one on the list. But there's also teams who are kind of in their preseason form right now. And I think we saw a little bit of that uh, out of Tottenham, quite frankly. But now we've got teams that are kind of going through their seasons and they're in form. So we're seeing, you know, obviously racing Louisville and O.O. Reign 
Club America, who has been, you know, getting some fixtures in with Liga MX Feminel, it's going to be maybe a little bit different, right? And it also, I think, is going to depend on, you know, how Laura Harvey and the Rain are going to approach this type of tournament. This is something that's happening alongside their regular season. All Rain are currently in a bit of a playoff push, right? They're sitting in the upper half of the table, uh, but I'm sure they want to try to bump their standing a little bit and get a higher seed, maybe even try to make a run at that shield while there's still time to do it. So I'm a little curious uh, in terms of the personnel that we might see available for these games. I mean, we just saw an ex exhibition match take place between uh, Angel City FC and Tigres Feminil, and we did not see uh, a typical yeah. lineup against that team. We saw a lot of the bench players, players who have not got a lot of minutes with Angel City. That was the team that went out there and present, you know, and represented Angel City in a starting eleven. So I'm curious as to what Laura Harvey is going to present here as well. I think that's going to come into play as well. So I think it's going to be maybe perhaps, dare I say, the more exciting of the two semifinals because we've got a couple teams that are like in form and there's a little bit of question marks there. Um, so I'm going to go, I'm going to go Club America just for, for parody's sake. And we'll see uh, what we get to talk about when we recap uh, this game as well. So let's take a look at the other semifinal. That's going to be the tournament host. It's Racing Louisville FC going to be hosting AC Milan in this semifinal. This one is going to be uh, the later doubleheader of the two on Wednesday. This one kicking off at 7 p.m. Eastern time. Who do you got in this one, Lisa? So the, I'm... I, I always think so much about this and I come up with so many <laughs> great stats and analytics and I do my research because frankly, it's my job, but I love to do it. I want an NWSL final. I would love it. <laughs> in the women's I cup. I would love to see it. So I'm just going to say racing Louisville wins this one. However, I would not be surprised if AC Milan wins, frankly. Um, Look. At, just in terms of the form that racing is in right now, they – I'm not sure how this midweek action is going to go for a team like this, honestly. I'm with you on that. The rain have shown that they are an incredibly frustrating team to play, right? We're talking a little bit about spoilers teams who are in that second half, uh, lower half of the table and racing has shown that they are absolutely one of those teams this year. And uh, I think they're going to continue to be a frustrating team uh, to, to play against. I think they're going to present some challenges to an AC Milan side that they are not used to seeing uh, against their other Serie A competition. Although they had a really cool opening match against Tokyo Verdi, Aslani getting a couple goals uh, off the bench at that. So we'll see if uh, she continues her form against racing, but uh, I'm going to go racing. With nice as well so we'll see if we do get that all nwsl women's cup final but believe it or not this is actually a triple header of games so we've got the two semifinal matches but what's kicking everything off on wednesday is actually a fifth place game as well so it. folks can actually see tokyo verde and tottenham one last time in the women's cup that's going to be kicking all things off on wednesday at 2 p.m eastern so you got a 2 p.m eastern uh fifth place game and then two semifinals at both 5 p.m and 7 p.m so make sure you tune in on paramount plus to Wait, watch are we gonna give picks for tokyo versus tottenham why not i'm gonna say tokyo gets this one uh, I will give it to Tottenham. I'll All give right. it to Tottenham. I don't think we saw a full game from them against Club America in that opening match of this tournament. Um, but right. they, I'm excited for this game. I really am. We'll see. We'll see how it, it, it breaks down. There is the women's ICC taking place as well. This is actually just getting kicked off. Women's Cup has been in, in progress, but uh, WICC is going to kick off on August 17th through the 20th. Portland Thorns are hosting this tournament in Providence Park. Uh, this similar uh, energy into last year. They were the host of this one as well in last year's WICC. Uh, audiences in the United States can catch all the action uh, on ESPN. And four teams involved in this tournament. It is Lyon and Chelsea, Portland and Monterrey. So... Uh, a good group here, uh, mm -hmm. exciting group. I know folks are excited to see the arrival of Chelsea because it's not Leon's first time participating in this tournament. We got to see them um, go ahead and play last year, but the arrival of Chelsea, the introduction of Monterrey, cool to see Rayadas in this mix. It's the first time 
that a Liga MX Femenil team uh, participates with the WICC. And that's very cool because I kind of got on a little soapbox about some of these tournaments last year. And I said, gosh, you know what's really missing from a lot of these tournaments in my opinion are mexican teams i would love to see like some latin american clubs in this in, in some of these tournaments and one of the criteria for women's icc is the way they flesh out this tournament teams that are invited to participate in this have to be entering the WICC as winners within their respective league. So Chelsea's coming in as, you know, Super League. You know, when we got Lyon coming in as winners in, in their league, we've got Portland Thorns, you know, coming off of their shield. And and we've got Monterrey coming in to the mix as well, having won in Liga MX Feminil. So I'm very excited uh, for this as well. There's almost too much. <laughs> soccer happening this week slash this weekend but uh, make sure you tune in for Lyon and Chelsea at 8 30 p.m eastern and Portland versus Monterrey at 11 p.m eastern the double final date will be on Saturday at 8 p.m and 11 p.m eastern so you'll get a chance to see third place match and uh, the uh, cup final so tune into that if you are able but that's a wrap for us here today on attacking third make sure you watch all the soccer there's something wrong with you know saying hey i'm gonna dedicate a whole 12 hours to <laughs> watching soccer we do it quite often so uh you know if you want to have your brain fried and scrambled with soccer and feel like lisa and i on some weekends feel free to join on in uh but if not you can always come back and just tune in with us and we'll have all the updates for you. So thank you all for listening to us. Thanks for everyone who voted for us. A reminder to please check your email to see if you've been chosen to vote for attacking third in the final round and make sure you enter to win a hundred dollar Paramount plus gift card. Subscribe to us on YouTube, like this video and drop your social media handle in the chat. Watch the women's cup on Paramount plus, and we'll be back with more on Friday, midweek game recaps, weekend previews, so much more. For Sandra Herrera and Lisa Roman, this was Attacking Third.